Lasky and John Solka. Uh, hey, welcome to the Command Post. I'm Rick Lasky. I'm John Solka. And uh, we're here live at FDIC, the greatest show on earth, the uh, largest conference in the world, and a great opportunity. We just, uh, I've said it for years, it's, 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 and we say this every year here, it's like Disney World for firefighters, except instead of the ears, they wear helmets. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got all the all-stars here, just out there, starting by John Bittendorf and a bunch of other guys. It's, uh, Always, always a thrill and always a, a little treat to be here. Did they hit a home run with the purple one? Yeah. Very, very nice. Art, art of reading buildings? In spite of no fire on the front cover, very, very interesting <laughs> book. The art of reading, the art, there's a lot of great books down there, trust us, but the art of reading buildings, that was just, you got the art of reading smoke with Dave Dotson, all of us. And John Midwest, who we love. Who we love, John Midwest. To put that book here, when it first came out, um, I couldn't wait. I ordered mine, and when I got it, I, 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 I took a picture of it, and I said, okay, I got my copy. It was just, it was just, you know, and what a tribute to folks, you know, folks that are gone, like like Brannigan, that was always preaching that, and now we have another generation of guys carrying that message forward, and, and even going a step further. Well, you, we talked about it um, yesterday in our practice class, our scenarios. Everything from we fight resident, we fight commercial fires like we did with fight residential fires, which is bad. But the fact that we just don't read the building, we just smoke. We just, I mean, how can you pull up and make decisions? Now, I know there's nothing showing you get inside, you got a room going or whatever, but when you don't, Brandon used to say, the building is the enemy. The it's fire is the ammunition. The building, you got to know the, the building. Compartment. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, how many collapses, how many different things were, were the fires, mm -hmm. everything from how the, the fires react to the building, the buildings react to the fire. And two great guys, two great, you know, instructors, guys with great experience, guys with great resumes, you know, uh, just a pleasure. I just love Ben Oh, I, you know, and, and, and for our, for, for, for our viewers and our listeners, um, there's a great story. If you've been on, if you've been on a, a list of the command post, well, you go back in time, you can listen to it. Look for the one in the archives where John, Chief John Mitt, his story, we talk about passion, we want to be a firefighter, not this, I want a paycheck, I want to carry the pay to my valley place, I just want a job. I want to be a firefighter. That was his name, I want to be a firefighter. And uh, we were just talking about the story. He was, he actually was a quarter, half quarter inch, inch, quarter inch too short, and he failed the physical. For LA, yep. For LA, for Los Angeles, and he went home devastated. And his dad, who was a, a firefighter, says, oh, we can fix this. Called, I got your appointment two weeks now in the morning, because what? You wake up, you're you're taller because your body's right. like you're laying down all night. You're spread out a little bit. And they went to what a chiropractor buddy of theirs, and he designed a rack. He designed a plywood two by four with ropes rack to stretch him. And for what two weeks, they stretched him like every day. day for an hour or something. Yep. And then when it was time to go down to the city in the morning, the morning for, for this, they, in the back of the pickup truck with the tailgate down because they couldn't fit it. They put the racks. They wrapped them down and tied them down, stretched. And, and they're driving down the highway. People are blowing the horns. Beep, 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 beep. Can you make your cell phones out? John's dad is driving the mm -hmm. truck, and John is strapped to the board in the bed. People are pointing all the way down to fly headquarters to take his exam. If that was nowadays, they would have put spike strips out there with roadblocks. And well, he jumped up, untied him, jumped up, ran in, passed, passed the height test, and the rest is history. He said, well, the, the butts, right? You got to stand the butts so you can't cheat. Foot, foot, thing in the head. The guy goes, oh, you're a good three quarters inch of the good. I don't know what you're worried about. Yep. Can you imagine, story. Story. imagine a fire service without John Mitchell. Yeah. Who said that? I just, he's just a great guy. We know him, but that was, you know, great. So we had a great class yesterday morning. Yep. Fill the room. I like leadership. Great crowd. But, uh, well, leadership is popular, popular now, thank goodness. Right? Us, us and lots of other people talk about leadership, which is, uh, uh, thank God it's not too late. But, uh, yeah, we had a good, good class and good questions, good, good interest level. Um, a, a great cross section of people that have firefighters, company officers, chief officers, which is always good to have as well. Firefighters scenarios went good in the afternoon. Yeah. A little, a little less room. attended because sometimes scenarios are more like standing out in front of the building. A little, little bit, you know, it's quite, not quite a listening exercise. Sometimes you actually gotta you gotta put your best foot forward and, and, and make a call. And some people are a little embarrassed to do that. But the folks that showed up for our class, 
did a bang up job, did a great job. Well, and, and we talked about it. Sometimes it's easy to wear your your heart, your feelings on your shirt sleeve. And a lot of I think a lot of people get hung up on their favorite tactic, which may not be the best tactic. We, we you know we're just so used. So you said it. You could you the exact words you said. You, you, there's a lot of people that fight fires. Maybe not the right way, but the wrong way, and they get away with it over and over and over again. Unfortunately, and then and they think it's okay then, and then one time they get caught, and then we go, "Why were you doing this? Well, I've done that. We've always done it this way. It was dangerous work, right? We've always done it this way." And you you brought that up yesterday, where it's a great point, you know. But they do. They get a little, a little intimidated, a little, uh, you know. Uh, I don't want to stand up and say stuff, but we had some great discussions. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then I ran into. Uh, uh, our National Fire Academy uh, superintendent back down the hallway, and uh, Dennis O'Neill, and he was honored the other night at the uh, Congressional Fire Service Caucus dinner, which I attended for the second time in my career. I've been in fire service for a long time, but I only made my he made my way there twice, and and the other night was I was so thrilled that that he was being honored uh, at, at the dinner. And well, well deserved. So well deserved. Hey, um, uh, very popular program this year, a professional volunteer. You know. Was that uh, Tom Merrill? And it's a column too now, right? It's uh, a column. Well, it's a column long before. Long before it was here, it was a column. Uh, I uh, I got invited. The long and the short story is, I got invited up to uh, his fire department in, uh, outside of Buffalo. And the guys called me up. The assistant chief called me up, emailed me, and then followed up with Paul. said, hey, chief, you, you got to come up here. Our, our chief, Tom Merrill, he, he loves you. Every time he gives a lesson, every time he makes makes a, a, a case for something, oh, chief's office says this, chief's office says that. I said, oh, that, that's, that, you know, it always feels nice to hear the guy on a positive back there, but but he's getting out. He's been a chief for 15 years. He's leaving. We'd love you to come up and maybe have a surprise visit at his uh, at his dinner, his farewell dinner. I said, oh, we'd love to. So we worked that out. I came up for a seminar in the morning and told the chief and everybody else that that was it. I was leaving at noon, going home. But of course, they brought me back to the hotel, and that night they they stuck me into his into his dinner, and it was he a good surprise. Know. Didn't know I was coming to the dinner. Told, told me goodbye after the seminar. Okay, great meeting you. Thanks so much. You played up. Like, oh, yeah, we had a great, you know, see you later. Where are you? Oh, yeah, great. I'm sorry I can't stay for the dinner time, but I got. After the dinner, he came up to me and just one of those low key, soft spoken, humble guys who's, who's got great, great accomplishments. And he said, Gee, I hate to impose on you, but is there any way you could help me? Maybe I'd look to break it into maybe writing or doing some teaching now that I'm not a chicken. I said, Oh, I would love to. So I helped, I helped line up some, you know, some interviews for him, and, uh, and, he, and he went to the magazine and had something published. And before you know it, he, uh, he had a couple of things published online, and, and here he is at FDIC doing a four-hour, you know, pre-conference uh, session that I stopped in this morning. I was in there for the first hour, and he was he was on a roll. He was on a roll. He actually showed up at the book booth just, just a few minutes ago where we were. And uh, so oh, it was an honor for you to show up. Thanks for all your help. And I'm, I'm having a great time. And it really, you know what? So I watched him. He's an actor. He's really good up there. And I'm just, I'm just sort of glad to play a small part and maybe open up a couple of doors for a guy to come in and, and be one of the next generation of guys. That, that's our job. That's right. right. We want to run advisory boards and everything else. Yeah. But what a great, what a great cow. What a great Great message, a great topic, a volunteer fireman, a professional volunteer. And, and we said it, uh, uh, ISO, almost 40,000 fire departments just under the United States, but 80% are still yep. volunteer accommodation, less than 3%, 4%, whatever it is, I mean, have to be off just slightly, use no form of volunteer fire services. The largest accommodation department is New York City, New York City, with like nine volunteer nine. fire, all but Manhattan, right? Nine, nine volunteer companies. Every <laughs> one of Manhattan has a volunteer company in New York City. Most people don't know, but uh, again, trivia. The point is, about the volunteer fire service is alive and well in America, even though it ails from some, you know, lack of manning and lack of staffing sometimes because of the economy and people working side jobs and stuff. But still alive, if not well, well, still alive. You know, it'll always be that one. <laughs> They'll always be there. <clears throat> I was in. Um, uh, kind of kind of interesting. I was in um, uh, another part of North America, and I was doing a leadership class in the afternoon, and in private of the evening. And, and John, I'm, I'm teaching, and it's a classroom, an old firehouse upstairs, and there's an aisle down the middle, tables and tables and chairs, right? <clears throat> and all the same uniforms. And I, by halfway through the class, I noticed that these guys, this group was a little bit different. This group. So I finally said, Are you guys like a different district or battalion, or what are you? And one of the guys says, Well. We're the professional officers, they're the volunteers. I said, okay, so what we have is our terminology mixed up. 
And they said, <clears throat> so you, you're, you're the career officers, you're the volunteer officers, but you're both professionals. He goes, I said, no, I know it says it on a sticker, but all the labor management stuff I've done, all the contracts, all the mediation, all things, yeah, I'm sure there's one out there somewhere. But I haven't seen anywhere they refer to professional versus volunteer. It's usually career versus volunteer part-time. But you're both professionals. You know, you want to be honest, there's, there's professional prostitutes out there. Yeah. All right. If you want to be like, you know, you probably hey, where the professional prostitutes out there. You know, that's what they call them. I understand what you're saying, sure. but sure. you've chosen this career. They have another career. They chose to protect the communities you serve. But you both can be professional. And Tom, Tom made that very clear this morning. The portion of the program that I sat through, he actually up on the slide, up on the top of the slide, he had the definition of the word professional up there. And and nowhere did it talk about, you know, receiving compensation or pay or anything. It was all about the level of your service and positive attitude and the, the discussion of people that do a, a, an excellent good job at, at whatever task that they, they had undertaken. So uh, I tell you, even here, I was taking notes because um, a little well, bit of time from the FDMI. You've here for like 40 years. Exactly. I'm still in the volunteers. So I'm an assistant chief right now in the South Bloomingdale. Siren. I'll get by the ball. Get the, get the siren in the truck and the whole nine yards. But, uh, you know, second time through, I was chief in 96 and they brought me back. It'll be almost 20 years to the day when I when I take it again. But the point is, I was taking notes in Tom Merrill's class this morning about some elements of uh, recruitment and retention for volunteers that, that, that have become a little bit more problematic in, in modern day than it has been in the past. And uh, he, he brought up some ideas on his little bit. The hour that I spent on his four hour class were worthwhile me right now and maybe doing when I get back. So uh, I'm sure all the folks that were in this place and he had a nice crowd there, I'm sure they all had a great time and, uh, and, and brought some good points out of it. Well, and looking at as long as we have, you know, a lot of do this, which was easy because you created a Get Out Live like in 1990. Same time I could create a statement of our own, it, it just was natural to get involved and look at it. Part of the program was looking at line of duty deaths and why it causes and contributing factors and so on and so forth. And I've never, I was a volunteer for a long time, same time as a career guy as well. And before then, I, I, we, we've never seen fire burn one worse than the other. You could be just as dead. You know, we, we talk about you could have one fire 40 days, one fire 40 years, only takes one time. I, I we, you've heard of it say before, there's been times, folks, where we have said in class, we wish we had written out over the past 20 years, how many times we've been somewhere they said one of two things. We thought it would never happen here, or we're just a small fire department. And you know, grant, grant, demographics are as tight as yeah, small one station, whatever, but you know, one of the first things when people say that, well, where are you from? Well, I'm just from a small one or two station department. We always stop them right there, so hey, say, so your, your firefighters, you know, don't die as easy as the other guys. Because it's not always the big cities. If you read the reports, it's not the big cities as much as it's some of the smaller parts. Not to say they don't know what they're doing. It's, it's the demographic. It's, it's when you look at how many big cities, metro cities, and how many other ones. It's everybody. You got just as good a chance to get hit by a car, burn in a fire than anybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about dedication and, and service. Yeah. You know, I got a question for you. And we'll throw this out there. You and I. Have, We've taught leadership for a long time. We've taught values for a long time. We've talked about being people of integrity, people of good character, all that stuff. You know, I don't know whether it's just every now and then, maybe it's just heightened by a bad one, or it just seems like we go through these ups and downs. All of a sudden, I don't know, maybe it's just because of social media, the media itself. We got, we got, and I'll just say we have nitwits doing stuff in the firehouses away from it that, that are just, I mean, the big big one just published in Texas recently. With, with it's just it is it's a sexual assault. We had that going on in our department with somebody a long time ago. We got rid of, and, and people actually condone. It's one thing to flower someone's sheets. It's one thing to you know the water, but to physically hurt someone, you call yourself a brother or sister, to physically hurt someone in our business, mentally or physically, is wrong. Is it not? Oh. Absolutely. Where, where does the where does the it's okay come from, or it's just you know we, we've talked about that you and I have a number of times both in the classroom and in restaurants and at other gatherings. Um, I, I think that's why, as I mentioned earlier, it's so nice to have done a leadership class and see other leadership classes. Just like what Bob Burns and his wife down there in the instructor room talking about his class they had this morning, very well attended, also very interesting. And you know, I think sometimes that in spite of the fact that leadership is catching on with fire service and leadership is being taught much more at conferences now and written about much more in magazines now than, than let's say five years ago. In spite of that fact, I think there's still a big void there. I think there's still lots of folks that don't have leadership skills, meaning 
that there might be some firefighters or junior officers participating or allowing stuff to happen. And maybe the, the senior officers are either out of touch with what's going on down the firehouse or they're in touch, but they're, they're a little hesitant to maybe say something and bring people out and say no. Um, so I think that's part of the problem. I, and I think another part of the problem, I don't know if it's, if it's equally as important, uh, is the fact that the fire service is always in, in, in evolving. It's always changing. There's always old people rotating out the door and new people coming in at the bottom. Like when we started teaching saving our only get out alive, I used to say, gosh, I've been doing this for five years, a couple of thousand people a year. How much longer could this last before everybody has it? Well, it'll never end because there's always people leaving and always new people joining. And I think there's always new people entering the fire service. There's always new junior officers being elected and moving up. It's a constant evolution. So we have to constantly remind, constantly train, constantly make people aware of what behaviors are acceptable and what behaviors are not acceptable. You can't say, well, we did our we did our hazing, we did our, you know, our, our management and leadership training by Jay Everest, we got the stuff, yeah, but you fired nine people since then and promoted four officers. So now you can have some people that didn't take that training and now they're in leadership roles or, you know, influential roles, and they may be making the same mistakes that guys made 20 years or 30 years or 40 years ago. Guys and gals, of course. And you're right, we're not following up with it. And and I, I think part of, part of the problem is, I think you just have to know First off, what's right and what's wrong? And some of the stuff that goes on, you, you have to be a world-class nitwit to not know what you're doing to someone is wrong. And then to compound, like you said, are people in leadership roles who have never been through, a, and I'm not to get through class, but some people have never been told, you always say, uh, I told you, should be your next leadership book. What's the title? You're not in the front seat to beat the horn. You're not in the front seat, you're not in the front seat to beat the horn. You know, it's your job. You know, the, the kind of, you can blame the firefighters all you want. You can blame the chief. And I don't know if the chief's all the responsible, but the, the person wearing these that, that they're on drill night or on Tuesday in the firehouse or on shift is the one that sets the tone, sets the tempo for what what, what, and they're out there. what does it. And the good bosses are out there. The, the good, I don't want to say stern, but, but the good, you know, officers that have everything in order and they ducks in order and, and they know what the priorities are and they let folks know what's expected of them. There's plenty of good officers out there that, that, that these folks don't misstep and don't abuse somebody, whether that be whether it be malicious, whether it be you know purposeful, or whether it be accidental. You know what? When you when you mistreat somebody, whether it's accidental or purposeful, the, the impact is the same. The point is there's some good officers out there that are holding the line and doing what they're supposed to do, and there's some officers out there that maybe because of a lack of leadership, or maybe because of a lack of training, or maybe because of a lack of experience, or maybe because of a lack of just human training. I mean, the, the problem with, you know, uh, firefighters in, in the fire service that you mistreat, mistreat people and, and, and go, oh, it's just hazing, we're just kidding around. The problem is that same behavior sometimes outside of the walls of the firehouse is acceptable, and, and it's not looked down upon. So, it's something that they might be doing in their private life or in their, or in their, or in their boat club or at their, on their softball team. But then when they show up at the firehouse, suddenly they, they take the same actions or say the same words that, that on the softball field on Saturday morning before was, was funny. Suddenly they're in a firehouse in a mixed group in a professional setting. And guess what? They, they commit a violation now. You know? So you know, some things people don't do on duty or off duty at home, in a backyard, or on a baseball field, so they don't come to the firehouse either. But there are things that people do, this conduct and behavior that people partake in outside the fire department, and it's fully acceptable. And I'm not saying it's legal or it's right, but the groups that they're in don't make a big deal about it, and then they show back up at the firehouse with a volunteer or career, and they make that same comment or treat somebody in the same way, and all of a sudden there's somebody making a complaint about it. And so, and, and part of that, Jen, don't you think, is I played softball for a long time, all right. There's a difference between going out and shop or whatever it is, and when you walk in a firehouse, if you want to if you want to wear the tattoos and the badges and the hats and the stickers and the stuff on your car and be America's bravest, and be, we've said it, you know, the interior, if you want to be led into little kids' bedrooms, if you want to be led into their bedrooms, if you want to be into people's homes, if you want Knox Keys to every business in town, you're there after hours with people's stuff, you know, there's a certain amount of responsibility that comes with that, and you can't go act like a buffoon woman at the village idiot, no. and then come in and be America's hero. Right. But next, you either have to represent, and that's a commitment. We, I think you said before, so I'm going to go back to that, 
with like our, our new firefighters. We don't do a good enough job across the country. I know we've done it at our places. First day, brand new fire, in the interview, to say, look, you, you come to work in this fire department, you're going to give up a lot of your rights. You, you go out and you want to be a thug, you want to be a bully, you want to go out and beat your spouse and be drunk in the street, it ain't going to happen here. You, you don't even have Yeah, there's no fire shirt up. They know you're with us, you're done. If you want to be America's bravest, if you want to be those people, if you want to be the one, no disrespect uh, to, to FedEx, when that truck drives down the street, people don't point, they point at the fire engine for a reason. You're in the little kids' books for a reason. So when you get to the firehouse, if you can't turn that stuff off, then maybe you don't need to be here because what? Well, how many times you said one idiot can ruin thirty Honestly, years? Correct. Oh, thirty years of CPR classes are gone. We know departments that have incredible firefighters and officers. A couple of guys let something go, or one guy, or whatever, and the whole department's like people go, "Yeah, have you heard about uh, bone gap?" Whatever. Well, no, they didn't. Do one guy or whatever. And you know, it's so true because we talk about it. Again, in some of our classes, sometimes just in our discussions uh, with, with friends and colleagues, we talk about, I, I was talking about that Jay Jones story. Uh, Jay's a great friend of mine, uh, Deputy Chief of the FDNY. He was my boss on duty, actually, my last night. And we, we were public school together. We were rescue three together. We had, a, we had a great career. And if you've never heard the name, then just Google the Miracle Stairwell B, and you'll have your... Right, right. Um, so, so I remember when Jay was a lieutenant. Well, before he was Captain Sirius, a six truck, he was a lieutenant. He was a pretty serious guy then, too. And, uh, and, and we brought this up to folks about being a good leader and having and having good good high standards and following them all the time. Well, you know, Jay Jones is pretty, I'm talking a pretty strict taskmaster on lots of stuff. Carrying tools, being in the right uniform, turning out quickly, you know, grooming, all those things. Like, what's wrong with that? Right, because <laughs> historically used to be important in the fire department. And I, and I think in lots of fire departments they still are them. But we like to tell the story of a guy that showed up at Jay's firehouse one night because a fellow that was on duty and working got injured and had to go home. And I had to call a guy from another firehouse elsewhere and bring him down to Jay's place. So in the middle of the night, this guy arrives at the firehouse, knocks on the door. One of Jay's on duty firehouse firefighters opens the fire door. Firefighter. Firefighter. Reached reach this incoming firefighter who was there for a detail for the rest of the night. Oh, hi, how you doing? Good. I'm up, I'm up in Harlem. I'm coming down for the night to, to work here in 11. You got a guy to tap out. Yeah, yeah, welcome. We're waiting for you. So they bring him in, and the guy's got his turn out gear with him, and, and he's wearing you know, a pair of fine department trousers and a pair of black boots. But he's got a t shirt on. He's got like a Boston fine department t shirt on or something like that. And the firefighter, the firefighter who's coming in from outside, do you have a uniform shirt with you? Like, he's, I'm wearing it. He said, no, 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 I'm not, not a Boston shirt. Do you have an FDMY like, shirt with a pocket on it, FDMY, the official shirt? Nah, we don't really wear that out there. And, and this firefighter says to him, well, we were not down here, particularly with Lieutenant Jones working upstairs. You, you, don't walk upstairs looking like that. You're, you're going to be sent back to your firehouse. He said, uh, what size you wear? Extra large? Yeah. Hold on a second. And he took one out of his locker. He said, yeah, just throw this on before you go upstairs. He, he's pretty serious about uniforms. And we all wear the right uniform here. I said, you know, you know that the firefighters are buying into their boss. You know they respect their officer when they enforce his rules. There was a firefighter telling another firefighter to wear the right shirt before you go upstairs. You know? How often should cool. the company officer have to handle those things. Right. If you got what? If you got, yeah, good, you got good firefighters that are already towing the line, they're gonna help the other guys they get the right shirt. Oh, don't don't they'll, they'll, tackle, you. they'll right. tackle you. They'll tackle you. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Do not piss him off or do not go, yo, this is how we work. Oh, and if we get a run, you better turn it off quick because we roll right out of here. They'll leave you on the apparatus floor standing in the blue smoke. You know? And then you, you go from Captain Sirius, which is a good Mike Spaulding, our good brother from Indy that was injured in the medical fight. This nickname, by the way, is Captain Sirius. Yeah. And, and, and for good reason. That's actually a compliment. You know, oh, it's actually a compliment. You have to be so proud to have a nickname. Have a uh, the good shows that I watch on TV was a comedy where somebody said, well, well, what's your nickname? You got to put, no, you don't, you, don't, you don't give yourself a nickname. Somebody's got to give you the nickname. I forget what, what comedy show it was, but it was it was one of the comedy shows of one of the big stars. And it was so funny because the guy was trying to figure out his own nickname. And of course, he ended up. A little, a little more embarrassing, you know. Well, you talked about Captain Serious, but you've also talked about Captain Leisure. Right, right. Another guy that actually I never worked with. I knew who he was. And uh, he was he was in the firehouse that I retired from before I got there. And he had that and he had that, that nickname, Captain Leisure, for, for for all the reasons you can imagine, just hearing that name, Captain Leisure. Imagine. I have a vision. What he looks like. The guy that came in two minutes before the shift and and walked around in his shorts and his flip flops and his Hawaiian shirt until 20 minutes into the ship before he went upstairs with a cup of coffee in his hand to maybe take a shower. 
really not ready, really not on the same time clock as everybody else. Although he was there, although he wasn't, you know, doing anything really ridiculous, his whole mood, the whole mood sort of sunk a couple of levels when he walked in because everything was uh, more about comfort and relax and then about, you know, turning out. We would have to train, right? right? We would have to do our inspections. Yeah, yeah. But everybody has folks like that. And, you know, we talked earlier, and it just, you know, it is all about leadership. And uh, we were talking about, I mean, there are just times where some of the stuff on the firehouse is beyond the jokes. And, and, and there's and, and the days of bullies and thugs needs to go away. The days of you know, bullies and thugs. You know, I had, I had it a couple of times. One time I had a bully. A bully hurt one of his own guys and up with this one and stuff. And we parted ways and stuff. And then a battalion chief on, on Facebook is calling him brother. And I, I don't know how you call someone who, you know, I just don't get that. You know, either you either you are a, a protector of your people, if you're an officer, your people come first on stuff, or you're not. And I think that, that shows a lot about You know, some of the things we see here at this conference, FDIC is a great conference. I mean, every conference I go to is a great conference. They're all different, you know, different numbers of people there and attendees and different programs being delivered. But what's great and what's not so great at the same time about conferences like this is, Sometimes we get into this mode of, well, you know what, everybody's got different opinions. And we, we started talking about uh, earlier at the table this morning, the, the UL NIST studies and, and everyone around the country about the work that those folks are doing. And, and that's just one issue of many that are out there that, that, are, that are debatable, that, that, that different people have different ideas about. And, and although I do agree in principle that lots of things are open to interpretation, lots of things, you know, we even talk about in our own class about do it your way. You know, leadership, you get to do it your own way. But there are still some, th some some things like wearing a proper uniform, like like wearing and donning protective gear, for PPE and SCBAs, like rapid turnouts and things like that. There are some things that that really are not up for discussion. There are still some good solid principles in fire service that that are, that are just the right way to go. You know, and I, and I think you, you can't be afraid to do that. Sometimes people are afraid to 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 harness everybody in, to corral everybody in, to well, us, lots of ways to do this, there's several ways to do that, but this is really only one way to do it, and, and that's the way we're talking about here, you know, so, you know, we hate to call people wrong, or gee, not really, that's not my favorite way, but, but sometimes, and I see that in good, again, not the word stern, but good solid bosses that have all the ducks in a row, here's, here's how we're doing it, you know, here's how we're doing it around, or at least at this shift in this company, here's how we're doing things, and if you're a boss, if you're in a leadership role, if you're a captain, if you're a chief, you shouldn't be afraid sometimes to put your foot down and say, hey, fellas, here's what's expected, and here's what, here's what we want you to do while you work here. And if you don't want to do it this way, you can just go somewhere else. This, this is our standard. You know? Exactly. You, you sign up to do what we're doing, and it goes back to what I said. You give up some of your rights. If you don't want to give up those rights to act a fool, then go make sandwiches or deliver newspapers, something like that. You don't need to be riding a half a million dollar fire engine or a $1.2 million ladder truck. Or be in little girls' bedrooms with their parents, you know, little boys and girls, you know what I'm saying? Right. There is a trust. We've said it before. You name another profession. If you've been to our class, where is it? You name another profession yeah. as a trusted fire service. No disrespect to anybody else. Please don't get mad. You name another profession. You can't. We love our cops. I was a cop. You love, you, you love me. I, I love our cops. So look at the challenges they're going through right now. And those are good, you know, a lot of good people. Um, my my father-in-law, minister, told me a, a long time ago, he goes, it's not the ministry. Look at but you think about it, and we say in classes, right? You show up tonight with that baseball hat on, that uniform, whatever, that t-shirt, sweats for that water. Someone will hand you their baby. Two o'clock in the morning, two in the afternoon, they'll hand you their child. They don't ask you, when's the last time you started a pediatric IV? They hand you their baby. Their baby. They didn't do the hospital. They go to the hospital and wait a minute. Are you a specialist doctor? No, she has a breathing problem. No. They hand you their child. You, you ask people all the time, you go around the class, you go, who's got 40 years or 30 years here? I got 35. You ask them, how many times have you been patted down? Yeah, Maybe house, house, empty your pockets on the table. You know, what's the last time you heard someone's wife say, honey, hurry up, go back in. I got, I left my dime ring in the counter. Go get for the firefighter steals it. We, we said in class, I love saying in class, and we, we, and for, so, for, the, for our listeners and our able to watch us right now, there's, there's a thing we do in class. Where I, I, I do this little thing where I, I cut my hands together and I walk real softly, like I'm carrying something very valuable. Coming out of a fire building. Coming out of a fire building, on fire or done, right? And I go, it's not a kitty cat. What is it? And let, let's see, I guess people, personal belongings, someone's ashes, cell phone, keys, money, jewelry, 
photo albums. That's the difference. You walk outside right now, this, this conference, and you see a firefighter. Say, hey, John, what do you got there? Hey, I found some as well, dude. Really? Uh, how much money is it? I, I, I don't know, but the driver's license is Timothy Johnson, right? They don't count the money. You see someone else from another world. Hey, what, what are you doing there? What do you got there? Hey, I found someone's wallet. Whose is it? I don't know, but it's got $157 in it. You counted the money? I told you, you, right, you and I talk about this. I go into panic mode. I find someone's wallet. It's like someone's cell phone. You don't even want to open it. Oh, my God. Please, I hope this guy didn't cancel his credit card. It's got that sucks. And you're trying to duck. And I, you call like this way. Put the driver's license. I don't care if you you have to call this person. I'm Rick Lansky. Tell him, here's my cell I found their wallet. Tell him about the Kansas credit cards. It's all right here. The guys, well, it's my money. I didn't count your money, dude. All your stuff's here. Is it you tell like the cell phone story, right? You know? Yeah, well, it's also true. And, and and the other story that we tell when, we, when we're talking about that, about standards and about doing the right thing, uh, when my son went to OCS in the Marine Corps, uh, he graduated, went to, his, went to his, you know, his graduation. And a captain, Marine Corps captain, instructed at the OCS school was talking about it. And he told all these old, almost 300 of them, a bunch of, bunch of brand new second lieutenants. He told them all, listen, he said, you're, 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 in, you're in an organization, you're in the United States Marine Corps. He said, and if you don't uphold the standards, if you don't enforce the rules of this organization or, up, or uphold the standards of this organization, you're simply enforcing new lower standards. You're establishing new lower standards if you don't enforce the ones that are accepted, the ones that are written down, the ones that we live by. And it's so true. A lot of us do that by default, by silence, by saying nothing, by doing nothing. You actually can can do one to your organization. What's our idol, Colin Paul say? Never, never pass a mistake. And walk past a mistake. And walk, and you walk past a mistake. It's like in the harassing, the harassment world, and it isn't just sexual harassment. The bullies and thugs as well. The bullies and thugs are harass. If you don't say nothing, you'll do something. You're just as guilty. And if you walk past a mistake, if you walk past stuff, and I loved it. I loved What's that thing. famous saying? I'm trying to remember the famous saying that bad things happen when good men do nothing, right? Sometimes doing nothing is a big mistake. It, it's stepping up a leader. Again, it comes down to we just don't do it. And we, why we do our company officer cabinets? We do it for years. A lot of them out there now, but we've been doing it where you know it's that, uh, with the exception of God bless the FTNY or maybe Chicago or these bigger departments, the majority. John, correct me. We talked about this. When you get promoted, they go, "Here you go." You're a, you yeah, said sure. we do. We do how much training for our new firefighters? You know, it's pretty funny. I saw somebody brought this up one time. I either read it or heard it at a conference. So somebody said, you know, you get a guy off the street that you've never met in your life. 19, 20 year old kid that's just enjoying the fire department. Fly upon him. And he shows up and he takes the application or he takes the exam and you let him in. And what's the first thing you do? You go to 5501. After you get done with 501, you go to 5502. After that, you, the teacher train you this. We're going to train you how to do force e and EMT. We spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours to get this guy on board to ride in a crew compartment of an engine. Then we have a guy who's working for us for 10 years, got a wife and family in town, a loyal employee, been doing a great job. He makes a lieutenant. We give him a new shirt, send him to his new assignment without, without giving him so much as a piece of paper. It's hoping, hoping that the guy he was working for was doing the right thing. What what happens? Well, he could be working with Captain Sirius, or he could have worked 10 years with Captain Legion. And if he worked 10 years with Captain Legion, he's probably Lieutenant Legion too. The only hope you have is that his upbringing, her upbringing, maybe old, you know, they had good parents yeah. and they just stuck in a bad fire. Well, it is amazing. We spent thousands of dollars and thousands of hours on a brand new employee. And then we have a guy who's got 10 years invested in our organization and looking forward to 10 or 20 more. And we just give him a new collar pin and a new shirt, send him to a new assignment and say, throw you ass. Then we jump their ass later because they did something wrong that we didn't tell them how to do, you know. Absolutely. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, and, and we talk about it. And this one particular class I have, I have the three circles of influence in fire service. When it comes to not just line of duty, it's everything. There's the firefighter circle, the company officer circle, and the chief circle. And that's where you and I have honed in on. We're not not training firefighters, we're chiefs, but if the emphasis on, on training company officers, if we can train the company officers to be better officers, to be better prepared, to mentor better, to prepare their people. One of the many things that you do is prepare their people. Then we're influencing this circle down here, and in, in essence, we're creating better candidates moving up the line for the majority of the time. And are we not creating better candidates moving up the chief? Because if we're not training as company officers, then they get brought to a chief officer position. Right. The deficit never gets never dissolved. And then we wonder why we've got problems. And these are not bad people. Right. There's very few businesses out there that, that would that would, say, would would. Would the Marine Corps, would the Marine Corps promote somebody up to a position not train them how to do that position? No, look at that officer candidate school. That's a that's a big, long, 
difficult. What did James have to do to even get into the trade for special operations? Oh, oh, I, I have a certain amount of time in the job, a certain amount of you know uh, qualifications, you know, classes under the belt. Like class that. Was, was like absolutely. seven weeks. How long was that? You know what? I'm trying to remember. OCS was quite long. It was not OCS, but it's special ops. Well, well, the well, special ops is going to be a nine month class. But he had to like a seven week entry. Seven week entry. You know, how got into it. You got to go through seven weeks of training just to get through the front door. And then they and then they trained it for nine months and you have to pass that as well. And I know we don't have the budgets to do some of the stuff, but there, there are, I mean, there was a recent line of duty that one of the recommendations was we need to uh, train, we need to train for our, com our company officers. I'm like, so you know, there's a difference when you read the report and when you read the recommendations. There's a difference between revise our SOGs, SOPs on this versus develop. When you say develop, in my world, that means you never, you don't have it. Right. Develop means we're creating. Right. Revising is something else. When you say exactly, when you say we need to develop company also the training and all stuff stuff so I'm like, you know, really? And, and, and again. It, it, a lot of guys and gals get promoted thinking that's it. I'm up there to beat the horn. I got to do a log book and this stuff. Right. Right. And, right. and they've, never been, they've never, you know, well, some of the things we covered, John, in our class is how to handle some of those situations. When you've got the, we call them, we used to call them the problem child. We still do, but we also call it the leadership challenge. Mm -hmm. The coaching and counseling aspect is not really done well to give that lieutenant the ability to go, okay, especially a good fly fighter that, that was really never involved in that. A good fly fighter that never was, was a coaching of, of, of challenge himself. You know, he's never gone through that. I mean, boss may have dealt with some other fly fighter on his ship, but he, didn't, he he gained nothing by that. He gained no insight of the training. And, and remember the song, I stuck in the middle with you? I, I forget who wrote it, but that, that's the phrase I, I like to use when I talk about company owners. Steelers, Steelers. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> I, I, can hear, I can hear it right now. <laughs> and, and, and that's what company officers are. They're stuck in the middle. They're between the chief officers and the incident commanders and the leaders of the department. Yet they're also on the other side, the firefighters and the folks that are coming up behind the work every day. The guys who do all the work every day at the firehouse. You know what? They have loyalty in both directions. They have authority in both directions, you know? So it, it's a pretty tough place, a pretty hard seat to sit in, the company officer seat, because they get they gotta please their bosses and their organization to which they are an agent of the fire department and the chief, yet on the other side they get the firefighters who are working for them, who they are also trying to serve and protect and, and train and take care of and, 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 and work with. So it's a, probably one of the toughest jobs, I've always said, we've always said, the most important job in the fire service is the company officer, the folks that are in the right front seat on the fire engines and the fire trucks. That's the most important, and I'm, I'm quite positive that it's the most difficult position to come. Well, and, and that's where we keep people alive because we've said it. Yes, there are some departments that are strapped. Some volunteer departments where the chief has to ride the front seat or whatever, but the majority of times the chief's not going out there making sure it's in the morning that you park the rig right at the highway and everybody has the best time. I know it's not foolproof, but it's a step in the right direction. They're not the ones making sure, wait, put your put your seatbelts on. They're not the ones making sure nowadays you have your face piece on. All these things that need to be done that that person has to do is some of those things are on. Are on how about that gal we sat with last night from Canada? What was her name? Yes, sir. She she's captain. a captain, and, and we had a couple of good conversations last night at dinner, which was great. I never met her before. You have, um, and she was she Lisa was Melange, good friend. quite quite a disciplined officer. A couple of times we talked about well, she takes a day off or she's out sick or a vacation day or something, and and one of her uh, lieutenants act up as captain, you know, for the day or for the week or for whatever term. She says, I leave a note. I leave some instructions there. Please take care of this. Please get this done. Please do this inspection. Have this maintenance performed. And she said, if I don't do that, some of it may get done, some of it may not get done. They're not going to be going down hanging out of the bar somewhere. It's not going to go that far off the track. She said, but, but my stuff might not get done. She said, but if I leave a note, I expect that to get done. And she said, most of the time it does. However, she said, if I come back from vacation and three of the five things are not done, she said, I track that officer down. I find where he's covering now, what, what place he's filling in now. And I call him up and say, hey, uh, this is Captain Ryan from Engine 2. We worked last week. Yeah. She said, I see a couple of things didn't get done. What was, uh, what happened? What was the problem? Well, you know, we had a busy night on the 4th and the 5th. She says, to tell you the truth, I, I look back on the record for the 4th and 5th and see if they did have a busy night because it's pretty important to me that another boss be loyal to my to my request that I get some stuff done and not and not maybe try and you know deceive me and say I was busy but maybe they were just lazy, you know. And I thought that was pretty impressive that a captain was holding other officers, holding other officers' feet to the fire, saying, No, 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 no. You work here, this is my command. 
Here's what I want you to get done. Well, I ask you to do something. Please do it. Yeah. Well, when you work for her, for that kind of officer, in a roundabout way, you're creating more of you. And what that ends up happening, right, is when you now, now, now let's move out of the well, let's go, let's pull, let's go out the doors, let's go out the bay doors and go to a fire. And then you get there and you've got three companies standing there, and you need something done now, something now, really important, whatever. I don't have time to mess around. Yep. You, you know, and then we've talked about it. there's times we've had we both had. I, I had an incident where you know we, we had two kids in, and I turned and I needed someone right now to get in a room with fire over their heads, and I turned and looked. And Calvin Allison, great, 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 did I say great, great captain. Before I could finish, he says, Chief, I'm all over it. Yeah. And and one of the other two captains was like, afterwards, he goes, Chief, I'm a little miffed. Why did you not pick me? And I went, now's not the time to talk about it. Yeah. I said, now's not, and you want to talk about coming to a ship change, have a cup of coffee, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to like what you have to hear, but maybe we'll get there. And we had a talk, and it was about confidence. It was about, look, you know, rather than goofing off, Rather than you can't keep your mouth shut as an officer, rather than we're always working through issues with you and your guys. Well, it comes back to Captain Sirius and Captain Legion. Yeah, he wasn't, and he wasn't the right guy. That's right. And you had, you had the same and situation. And the worst friends with Tim Platt, I did the same thing. I picked I, I behind story. a couple it's of friends. You know, it was a, we urgently needed a line stretcher to a boat, and I was the acting deputy, and I had a couple of options right in front of me. But I went, I went to the guy in the back. Hey, Tim. Hey, hey, come here. And I called him up. He protested momentarily that those, what he, what he was doing, those, like, those companies were ahead. Was I'm bigger. third do with that first and second deal. I'm third do. I said, just come here. And I sent them into the fire out because I knew him and I knew his, his record. I knew his qualifications. I wasn't quite sure who the other fellows were. And one actually I knew and I wasn't real happy about it. And the other one I didn't know. And I'm not going to throw a guy in that I don't know. Make a long story short, people do that all the time. Whether you work for IBM, whether you work for the United States Marine Corps, whether you're a New York City Fire Chief, everybody goes to the people that they can depend on when they go and get It's not even, we joke sometimes about favorites, but. We tend to use go-to people, your go-to guys. The go-to guys, we say go-to guys and gals. Those are the people that you go. We talk about our leadership book about Curtis and Lisa. How many years teaching here hands-on where Lisa, she's a captain in Vaughn, Canada, right, 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 they work together. She wouldn't let you finish your sentence. You say, hey, guys, we need you to chief. It's already done. I'm like, I, I just, we just, we just let me finish my sentence so I feel important today. Right. Curtis, Curtis, the kind of guy. And we tell us so at a time when you when you had that talk with that lieutenant or captain or whatever, I was a battalion chief, and had that talk with that new firefighter. And then talk to that new firefighter their first day and before you kick them loose and hey, this is this, this is that, welcome aboard, all these different things. And then one of the last things you should say to them is, You need anything, you have any questions, come come get me, come see me, you, you know, you need you have questions, or whatever. And his reply wasn't, Yes, sir, yes, chief, or whatever, gotcha, must receive, you know, whatever, copy. He said, his reply was, Chief, all I ever ask you is if you ever need anything done, think of me first. And he's not an ass kisser in Apple Power. Right, right. That's he's, he's, the he's, the he's a chief of the department of Lake City. He's doing great things. If you know him, that's he's a stand up guy. He, he, he wasn't worried about it. He was like, Could you imagine? Oh, Chief, Chief Sonko, thank you. All I ask is if you ever need anything done, you think of me first. And that's it. That's what makes great five points. Oh, and it's hard not to chew. You're not, I guess you're not supposed to, you're supposed to give everybody a chance, but when there, there's times Nonsense. where you need things done, you're going to go, come here. I remember going down to the Aquanet School as a, as a new captain. And, and you know, and this can be for any new officer anyway, of any rank. Um, going down, knowing that, that it's, in, it's the morning, the rig's got to be checked, Aquanet Floor's got to be taken care of, you know, housework's got to be done, tools got to be checked, motors have to be run. Anyway, you assume it's getting done, but once you're your officer, you have to stop by and make sure things are in the way. And I'm mostly down to the apparatus floor. A couple of guys were, looked like they were just finishing up. They were just doing some last minute wiping, some washing some glass panels, uh, putting some tools away. And I said, uh, hey, uh, fellas, uh, uh, Tony, uh, Frank, we, did we get the rig, rigs done, uh, Captain? Oh, great. I said, did you, what about the, uh, the saw? Said, we ran everything. You didn't hit a motor drum before? Oh, oh, okay, you, you know what? Not even mentioning it. Yeah, I did hit a motor drum. All right, good. Then let's get the kitchen done and stuff, and, and then we're going to go. Kitchen's done, Cap. What's next? We're all done down here. We wrapped up. We've got a regular routine. And I still felt a little, you know, a little bad about what about this, what about this, what about this. But it was all done. It was all done because they're good professional firefighters that know what they're doing. They know what's expected. They know what's coming down the pipe. They know what you want. But you know what? I wasn't even a regular guy that day. I was just a guy filling in for the day. But they still were on, on their A game. They were still performing because that's how important it is. And it rolls out the door. Uh, Jerry Wells, our good friend, the talent chief of Louisville, here teaching FDIC, great, great program. 
Dan was a very well respected Dallas Battalion Chief a lot of years. Good guy. You know, and Jerry, I remember Jerry coming in, and um, I remember he went to a particular fire. He come over, he goes, well, I think I think we've arrived. And I'm like, what? He goes, we pulled up, and he got on the radio, and he went, oh. he was over my orders. If he goes, because, but, oh, okay, okay. And everybody was like, be quiet. It's like the guys behind me. Remember when you said a captain? About stretching a two and a half, you read the guys are in your heel. I turn around and make sure the treasure. I turn around, the guy bangs into me, says, You come to see me, stretch a two and a half, right? Got it right here, Cap. Move on. Go to go point your flashlight. Let us do better. You know, sometimes I say, Boy, they make a company officer job easy, but I don't say it because it doesn't make a company officer job easy. A company officer is the guy that that broke those folks in and showed them what the priorities were and what's expected of them and they're performing it right because they already did the round about success. Hard work yes. company. It, it makes maybe it makes my my job easy now, but there, but there was a company officer that busted his chops earlier on to get that stuff on the way. You know, and, and what's the same we use with the mentoring program, even which applies to that. One generation plants trees, while another enjoys the shade. Generation enjoys the shade. Nothing happens. Nothing in the fire service that's instant is any good. Let's say sold lottery tickets. Other than that, nothing in the in the fire services and it's it is any good. It takes a while. And you may not see that, right? We talk about the time. Sometimes you may not ever see the fruits of your labor. You may see those sparkles, guys get promoted doing things, but you know, my son with the Navy, what, I thought what he said, how to work on this really quick, right? Dad, we're planting trees. We're planting trees. You know, we're we're, we're planting the trees. Right, and only somebody who hears that phrase knows what that means. And no, yeah. On the other hand, the things that you are enjoying, like those fly fighters that are taking care of business without being told, you have to appreciate that because now you are enjoying the shade of what the old retired captain planted 20 years earlier. He's not even in the fire department anymore, and all of a sudden you're working with a bunch of great guys. Why? Because they got, they got set straight 18, 20 years ago by officers that are no longer on the job. You know? Oh, it's, it's, and I do appreciate that. He just gave me an idea. I'm right. It's done. I'm just, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. I took notes this morning in Tom Harold's class. What a great! He's not a young officer. He's he's new to the to the instructing, new to the training business. But he's got a long time. To well, there's there's just things that come. Sure, you're right. It's it, it, all this stuff has been established a long time. We talk about the integrity issue that we're just the caretakers of it. We think we're doing anything good, we're not. But those of that don't that, that, that step up, you know, those that don't do that stuff, um, you know, it, it, they're the ones. I mean, they're the ones that need to step up and say, look, you know what? Our responsibility is to carry the torch. Right. And Actually, we're caretakers, like yeah. you just said. We're caretakers. You received it. But we want to maintain it. Yeah, if you're going to prove it, or polish it up a little bit, fine. If not, at least keep it where it's at. And pass it on to the next generation. You know, before we go, I, I, I think we got uh, about five more minutes. About five more minutes. But I wanted to mention uh, for the folks that are listening. If you're listening and you're here at the show, obviously if you're not at the show, uh, why not? If, you, if you're not at the show, you can't go to the book booth. But if you are at the show, I want to talk about the book booth down there because. Uh, I, I was talking to several of the folks that are down there. I think they said they have between 12 and 15 brand new either titles or, or videos or, or other products down there. She showed me the one whole panel with several different shelves of brand new stuff that's never been out before. Uh, so that's great. Along with, I mean, John Norman was just down there with the fourth edition of his book. John Vinton was just down there with his book. You know, the, the authors actually were heading down there ourselves in the next hour doing some book signing. But whether it's ours or somebody else's book, there's a wealth of information. Everybody should go home with a new text or a new book or a new workbook or a new CD or something to bring home and share with the, with the truth at home. There's so many good uh, sources and resources available here that would be ashamed to go home and, and not bring something along with you. And if there's not, if you're not here for some reason, family, whatever you can get off, or go to Bundy, blah, 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 FireDreamingBooks.com. FireDreamingBooks.com. You go to it, you'll have a hard time. So I can, you'll be like, it's like trying to go to classes here. You know, I tell Bobby and Jay, thanks a lot, right? Thanks a lot. You know, can we do like the My Cousin Vinny thing where it's like, you know, what do you want to eat, breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Right. No, they got to give you like a million classes to pick. I know. Like my mom told me if I told you once, I told you a million times, I would graduate. But anyway, you know, there, there's just so much. That's been the, that's the best complaint to have in this conference is there's too much. How do you choose? And you know, I guess, you know, some of the good things is like keep coming back and next year you go to the next place. But there's certainly some repeating themes and repeating questions that are popular. Well, yeah, exactly. And then John, there's the guys that come here, and instead of all five or six of going to one class, they spread out. Right. They go, they get the camera, five guys go to five class. You go to them, and they go, and then they come back, because this is the fire department, it's FDIC International, it's the fire department instructor's conference. 
Well, like you give the five alarm leadership, there's a handout. You get a handout. We don't do it in the scenarios class because it's only like 10, 12 questions that you write down, and the pictures are real small. It doesn't make sense. But you leave, the majority of these classes, you leave with handouts or a lesson plan or something to go back to your department and, and share. And, and you know, to go to this conference, to go to any conference, to go to a class, we say, to go to a class and not go back and share is just incredible as well. You know, I mean, we talk all the time when you finish these up here with uh, make it go back and make a difference. The, the, the book, it's not from Fire Engineer Books, I apologize, but there's a place out there that we talk all the time, and I, I use this book for years, for, for, forever. I gave it all my staff years ago. 212 degrees, you read about 10 minutes. 212 degrees, the extra degree. And, and the point of it, I'll give this in a nutshell. If they're talking about the power of one degree. The power of one degree is this at 211 degrees, water's hot. At 2 or 12 degrees, 1 degree more it boils. So when boiling water, you can produce steam in which steam you can power a train, a locomotive. So the goal is uh, to try and go out there and fix our nation's fire system. Yeah, fix it. Right. Our state's fire, whatever. The goal is to go find your 1 degree. It's like uh, Curly from City Slicker with this. To go find your 1 degree. Worry about the things you can fix. Best advice, you've say a million times. Worry about the things you fix, not things you can't. Figure out what your one degree is, because what ends up happening is you figure that one out, and then you figure that one out, right. and then you figure that one out. Before you know it, you know you truly are fixing stuff that that your sustainability. Instead of it's a temporary fix, you fix it again next year. You find that one, concentrate on finding that one degree. And we tell us that one degree job for some guys may be they're going to go back and put the air pack on. They're going to they're check it. They're going to show up for the firehouse for the ship. They're, they're going to run a drill once every shift instead of drill when they want. Exactly. They're going to show up at their volunteer department an hour after they got a shadow. They're going to tell little Johnny Salka they had a problem with his air pack. That's called, hey, what are you doing Tuesday night? There's usually no one up here. Meet me here at 7 o'clock. You and I are going to practice. You're going to go find that one one thing you're going to make a difference. Yep. yep. And it's huge. So when you run, great to be in. Follow us, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitter. I've got. Uh, uh, John's been blogging forever. I'm, uh, Bobby and Eric asked me to do a blog at Firefighter Nation, so uh, primeoceanblog.com. Uh, 150 years of tradition. I don't think you have progress. No, I'm not bashing the movie, all you backdraft fans. My wife was in the movie. I like the movie. Um, the one we got out right now, which is getting a lot of uh, hits, I check it all the time, um, is are we too aggressive or are we just using the wrong word? Um, and I can look, I'd love to hear your comments. Please post them and Absolutely. you know we'll go from there. So with that, we're going to close it off for tonight. We never end any of our shows, uh, any of our programs without two very important words. And that's be safe. Hope it's over because I just got uh...
Hi, this is Scott Nelson. Uh, you're listening to Parent Hearing Talk Radio. That was John Salter and Rick Lass. We just got in at their command post. We're having a great FDIC here in Indianapolis. Uh, we've got a little brief downtime. Uh, Mike McAvoy is due up at 2.10 Eastern time. So uh, in the meantime, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a little music from one of our fellow firefighters, oh, 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 Eddie Buchanan, is at the band man. Uh, called Rosie Soul and the Rock and Roll Cowboys. So this is a little music for me to come back. We'll see you about 10 minutes.